You're watching the Retro Lube Channel. Closing time. This room won't be open till your brothers or your sisters come. So, so we have Jacob Slichter, the author of So You Want to Be a Rock and Roll Star and drummer for Semisonic. Hey. Hey, how you doing? Good to have you. Thank you very much. So tell me. Jake. Yes. Uh, how did you go from being a Harvard grad with uh, a degree in African American studies and history to right. being a rock and roll star? You know, um, I actually went to college with the idea that I was going to be a rock star. It was a really stupid idea, a really foolish idea. Um, and I got to college and um, I actually really got interested in, you know, the uh, things I was studying. For instance, Afro-American studies. I was really interested in black writers um, and writers on the left generally arguing about what people ought to write about, you know, what art is ought to do. Because I've always been interested in politics and this sort of combination of art and politics that these guys were putting together was really interesting to me. So um, I actually entertained the idea of going to graduate school. And I handed in my senior thesis and got uh, some very, you know, terse comments back and through my, you know, thesis in a storage box and really never looked at it again and just went back to plan, you know, the original plan, which was to be a rock star. Um, and so I was, what was I, 22, 21, 22 when I got out of college and I was in my mid-30s before anything really happened. So tell me, what was the process of creating Samsonic? I mean, from having a demo, to having a manager, to having all the stuff that actually creates a raw group that is successful. Um, you know, we had a great advantage because we're a three-piece band and the two other guys in the band. I spent all my time between college and Semisonic basically working temp jobs, you know, being an office gopher, basically, and then coming home at night and recording my, writing and recording songs in my basement, and I was getting nowhere. And then uh, two friends of mine were in a very successful band called Trip Shakespeare, which was on A&M Records. We were all lived in Minneapolis. They're Minneapolis-based band, and they packed the house at you know every big club that they played from coast to coast. Um, then they, you know, kind of uh, things got kind of rough for them. Their label dropped them, and then they broke up. Um, at which point, Dan and John, the two other guys in the band. Uh, invited me, you know, we got together with me and said, hey, let's start jamming. Uh, we started playing shows. The shows were really well attended, um, mainly because of Dan and John's popularity with their old band. People wanted to see what their next band would be. So, um, you know, we started playing shows. We started making tapes. Then Dan and John, um, you know, had little black books full of phone numbers of all these music business guys because they had gone around when Trip Shakespeare had had to get a record company so they had gone through all of the courting process of you know meeting the A&R people artists and repertoire the talent scouts of uh, record companies to go around and see bands and sign them or whatever. Uh, so they had actually they knew all these people who by now had been fired from and their old record companies and worked at new record companies so um, they knew people, you know, from probably seven or ten different really big labels. So we started sending them tapes, um, and they really liked what we were doing. Um, we were, you know, our shows were very well attended, so um, that was extra incentive for them to come out and see us. They flew out to Minneapolis, um, or whatever town we'd be playing in, you know, a couple of people saw us in Chicago, some people saw us in Nashville wherever. Um, this was all, of course, very new to me. I was getting basically in nine months or a year about 15 years worth of uh, training for being on the road, uh, mastering stage fright, uh, dealing with all of the just alienating effects of being on the road, and then learning how not to make a complete fool of myself <laughs> in front of all the record companies let alone the people at the clubs. You know, we'd be playing a show and I'd be thinking, well, don't fuck this up, Dan and John. You know, this is their big chance. You know, this is their second chance. Maybe it's their last chance at success. So uh, there was 
you know, just a lot of pressure to just like keep it together on the drums, get through this show, do a good job, and you know, try not to throw up. <laughs> and, you know, those were like my big goals back then. So, um, at a certain point, uh, it became clear that you know, Semisonic was kind of going against the tide at this point. We this we. The time period we're talking about is the early 90s now. So the big thing on the landscape was Nirvana. Mm -hmm. And Semisonic, you know, Nirvana had this amazingly huge, dark, deep, you know, in incredibly um, angry sound, you know. Um, Kurt Cobain's voice and Dave Grohl's drums, I mean, right there, that's just like a head start no band could ever match in terms of just what they had to express. And the whole tide of the music industry was following Nirvana, and every talent scout was out there to sign the next Nirvana. There were big guys in, you know, cigar smoking executives in LA and New York saying, Get me the next Nirvana! You know, and so they went out and signed a shitload of, of grunge bands. Um, some of whom are really good, most of whom were not. Um, but we just knew, I mean, Dan and John and I, uh, the music that we were creating was like incredibly wussified compared to Nirvana. I mean, we were like pop, you know, sugary pop uh, in a certain way. I mean, we were really in, in, into all the indie rock bands and all their methods for making records and all that stuff. But um, what we had to express was not at all going to fit in with that. And so this really complicated the record company dance because um, the uh, A&R people who came to sign us knew that we were not going to uh, sound like Nirvana. We weren't going to sound like Nine Inch Nails or Smashing Pumpkins or Pearl Jam or any other of the, the major bands around at the time. So uh, in the end, we were down to two companies. One of them, the A&R person who was after us, was the exact same guy who had signed Dan and John to a and Records. Now he worked for Electra. And the other person who was after us uh, worked for MCA. Um, MCA, the, nick, the joke was MCA stands for the Music Cemetery of America. Because all they had were old catalog, you know, Jimi Hendrix, who, Tom Petty. They had nothing that was sort of about what was happening then. Um, and MCA's pitch to us was, we know we suck. Come with us as we rebuild the label and you'll be our flagship band. Which I personally thought was actually a reasonable pitch to make. Um, Dan and John and our manager, who we had sort of, Dan had found a manager and, and a lawyer through all his, you know, various phone calling to everybody. Um, everybody advised us against that, so we went with Electra. So that's how, uh, that was sort of our, our long journey to signing uh, uh, a record deal. And we also signed a publishing deal. Um, and as soon as our advances came through, I quit my day job. So from that moment on, I was a full-time musician. Closing time. Time. This room won't be open till your brothers or your sisters.